The grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. This is the homely for the solemnity of our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the universe. I'm going to focus on the theme, Do you follow this King, Christ the King? On the Gospel, Matthew chapter 25, verses from 31 to 46. I'm not going to read the entire Gospel passage, but I will read partly so that you will have an understanding about this gospel passage. So Matthew chapter 25 verse 31 on. Jesus said to his disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit upon his glorious throne and all the nations will be assembled before him and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. A stranger, and you welcomed me. Naked, and you clothed me. Ill, and you cared for me. In prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? When did we see you ill or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them in reply, Amen, I say to you, whatever you did it did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did it for me. Uh, this is the gospel passage. Once again, this is not the complete passage. Uh, probably you will listen to it when you go for the Mass. But my brothers and sisters, I sometimes worry whenever I hear this gospel passage uh, read at funerals. The homilist will begin by telling us that the deceased was a good person who cared about others and tried to help them. Fair enough. We should always attempt to speak well of the dead. The problem comes when the preacher draws a sweeping conclusion that Jesus will judge us based on our works, whether we fed the hungry, welcomed the stranger, visit the sick, and imprisoned. I know, take a deep breath. While I certainly do not want to discourage the corporal works of mercy, Catechism, uh, Article 2447, feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, clothe the naked, visit the sick, and imprison, bury the dead, and give alms to the poor, I must strenuously object to the equation of salvation with deeds. Sooner or later, usually sooner, that view negates faith, grace, and the sacraments as essential to salvation. Jesus becomes relegated and reduced to the role of a hidden presence whose most significant activity is to observe and to be so pleased with our compassion and kind acts. The homily on Matthew 25 will often conclude with a sneer at churchy people because we focus explicitly on Jesus, we are sometimes accused of avoiding the real business of life, aiding others. I can live with a sneer, but I want to challenge what I consider a gross misunderstanding and misreading of the gospel passage. So, journey with me. First of all, in order to understand this gospel, the judgment of the nations, you have to see the entire picture. Uh, Matthew 25, at large. You all know that I have been telling this is a Mount Olivet parables. Jesus said this parable from Mount Olives just before his crucifixion, right? So it began with the parable of ten virgins, and then it began with the parable of talents, and then finally judgment of the nations. So you have to see this judgment of the nations in view of the parable of ten virgins and parable of talents. Now, what is this parable of ten virgins? You can see the sacramental dimension in these parables. And I have been telling you, the parable of ten virgins is the virgin. It's a corporate bride, right? The church. So how do you enter into the church? By baptism and communion. In communion, you become united with the bridegroom. So you become part of the bride through baptism and communion. So you see the sacramental dimension. And then the parable of talents the talents is to, to, to multiply the talents, to, to spread it, to give the faith to others. Confirmation, we receive the Holy Spirit so that we can bear witness to Jesus, talk about Jesus without fear. We can also do that through marriage, 
you marry your husband or your wife and you have children, you bring them in faith. Or you can become a priest by holy orders. Thereby, you multiply the faith. You give that faith to everyone. So the parable of talents here, the, the second dimension you see. The third one, judgment of the nations. You know, judgment of the nations is God is judging. Actually, this is a general judgment when, when parousia happens, when Jesus comes with this mighty power, with the glory. That is what we read. The Son of Man, when he comes in glory, he's going to judge you. So what happens in the confession, sacrament of confession? You face the priest, right? But the priest is persona Christi. He is in, in the person of Christ. And God will judge you. But most of the time in the confession is mercy. He's showing his mercy through confession. If you repent for your sins. And the same thing also is anointing. So now that is why they call it this a sacrament of healing. The healing takes place. So the judgment, if you are prepared, you will be with God. You will be shown mercy. So that is how we should look at this parable. In the sacramental dimension, my brothers and sisters. But don't try to look at the judgment of the nations exclusively. If you try to read that exclusively, you will misunderstand. So let us now jump inside this parable and try to find out what happens. In my life as a priest for 11 years and as a Catholic for so many years, I've seen people misunderstanding the Christian faith and live a life of extremes to the extent of being more anti-Christian. The problem is that they just don't keep their misunderstanding with themselves. They all have the inclination to spread the errors to others. Misery loves company. Let's see the first extreme. You are saved by faith alone. Uh, probably you would have come across some people asking you this question. Are you saved brother? Are you saved sister? What do they actually mean by the word? Are you saved in the past tense, because they use this word very, very cleverly with the past tense. Why? Because it presupposes that salvation is a one-time event. So once you are saved, you are always saved. Even if you commit murder or watch porn regularly or commit adultery, you are saved. Because you have Jesus in your heart. This is a gross misunderstanding. That is why they emphasize you are saved by faith alone. That's totally wrong. But if you read the scripture, salvation is actually an ongoing process. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 we read, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul says, work out your own salvation. The second point here, he refers as if it is a future event. Romans chapter 13 verse 11, Paul tells the reader that salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. It is coming close as if it is future. So it, it, it is never referred as a one-time event. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 7, we read, By your stubbornness and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself for the day of wrath and revelation of the judge, just judgment of God, who will repay everyone according to his works. According to his works works eternal life to those who seek glory and honor and immortality through perseverance in good works through perseverance in good works once again it's not a one-time event you have to uh, work out your salvation work out your own salvation that's a very important point in james chapter 2 verse 24 james actually says the opposite of what some people claim you see that a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. I have been saved. So if anyone asks you this question, or you saved, brother, what do you answer? I have been saved. I am being saved. And I hope to be saved. So this is the first uh, answer to the first extreme. This is the second extreme, which I am really concerned about, because this is very successful than the former. Are you saved by works alone? Even people don't understand the concept of works biblically, especially in the New Testament language. First of all, whenever Paul talks about work, he expresses it in two dimensions. Number one is ritual dimension. What, what, do you mean, uh, what do we mean by ritual dimension is participating in the new Passover, Eucharistic dimension. You know, he always preached 
in a synagogue, invited people, celebrated mass. That is a ritual dimension when he says works, work out your salvation. Number two, it also means the other dimension, works of mercy. The Catholic Church calls corporal works of mercy and spiritual works of mercy. What we see in today's gospel passage is a corporal works of mercy. In fact, there was a, a, a person called Pelagius. Uh, he lived uh, from 355 uh, uh, AD and to 420. He was an ascetic layman, probably from the British Isles, who moved to Rome in early 380s. So the problem with Pelagius is, he said that we actually don't need grace of God to be saved. If you are good and you do good, you will be saved. Sounds familiar, right? Today, unfortunately, many people practice Pelagianism without even knowing what they are doing. Pelagius, that is what he preached. And Pelagius said that you don't have to uh, receive baptisms, confirmations, and all that you have to do is be good, do good. You will be saved. You don't have to go to the church. And, and Pelagius actually started it, but his successors made it worse. So semi-Pelagianism, there is also another heresy called semi-Pelagianism, is only a weakened form of Pelagianism which taught that a person could save himself. So that means you don't, have, you don't need baptism, you don't need confirmation, nothing of the sacraments, you don't, have, don't even have to go to church. You know, that's what many people do nowadays, right? To be a semi-Pelagian is to believe that we could save ourselves, but God just helps us to make it easier. The Council of Orange in 529 AD condemned these two heresies. And then they came and said that the idea that human freedom and divine grace work together for salvation. So you, you need uh, divine grace and also human cooperation is necessary. Why? Because you have the free will to say no to God. To understand this passage of the judgment of the nations correctly, we must take into account what precedes and what follows. The last two Sundays we have heard what comes before, namely the parables of the virgins and the talents. Last Sunday, they illustrate how God will judge those who hear Jesus' words. The parables apply directly to us Christians. We are members of the bride the parable of ten virgins. Jesus has entrusted us with enormous resources, the parable of talents. Consider what comes immediately after uh, Matthew 25. Matthew 26, verse 1 and 2, we read, When Jesus finished all these words, he said to his disciples, You know that in two days' time it will be Passover, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. The final judgment will ultimately require a response to Christ crucified. In Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46, is practically a description of Jesus on the cross. Who was jailed? Jesus, in two days' time. Who was thirsty? Jesus. Who was naked? You know, people crucified naked. And who was a stranger here? What do they, what do they mean by stranger is you consider someone alien and you mistreat that person. The cross stands at the center of human history, my dear brothers and sisters. It's a shadow has in some way fallen upon our entire race. I believe that Jesus will provide all men an opportunity to throw themselves at the foot of the cross for his mercy or to flee from the cross. Notice that the sheep cannot rely of the pride of works. They in fact were totally surprised by Jesus' judgment. When did we see you? In Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 to 10. Uh, for conclusion, I'm, I'm reading this passage so that you will understand. For by grace, Paul talks about salvation here. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God. Not because of works, lest any man should boast. For example, let's say you, ha you see a great sinner in the world and all of a sudden, he receives the call of God. And that call of God for repentance and for baptism, and that call from God, it's a gift. It's a free gift. It's, it, it is grace. So God, so this sinner never earned the salvation, but God, out of mercy, gives that grace. 
But you have to respond to this grace. And this person who receives this revelation that Jesus is calling him for repentance and mercy and baptism, he also responds, yes, Lord, I need baptism. So he calls for a priest. So he expresses through faith and he receives baptism. And then he works out his salvation, meaning then on he lives the righteous life. No more he is a criminal. He starts being a, a reformed convict. He, he lives a virtuous life and he tries to lead also people to Christ. So you see here the grace and the faith and the works coming together. That is what Paul is saying here. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not because of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his work, workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Dear brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to say is the corporal works of mercy is very, very important. But it is not an exclusive thing. You do engage in corporal works of mercy apart from Jesus. No. You need sacraments. You need Jesus in the Eucharist. You need to respond. You need to work for your salvation by coming to the church and celebrate mass you know participate in the mass and then you also reflect that closeness with god by seeing jesus in the poor those who are in need and you you also help them that should be our perspective first of all you may ask this question why do we have these readings on the solemnity of christ the king today many catholics and christians who do not like to involve their lives with Jesus or his church, but they strongly believe that they being that they being good, they are very good people, will give them the fast pass to eternal life is nothing but the consequence of relativism, my brothers and sisters. People sometimes they say, I am a good person, but they don't go to the church. They don't participate in the Mass. They don't like to receive the Eucharist. They don't even worship God, but they claim themselves to be a good person. But just by being good, by your own understanding, you think that you can go to heaven? The passage is actually saying the opposite. There is no fast path to eternal life. If you have this thinking, it is because of relativism. What is relativism? Bible talks about it in Judges 21 verse 25. This is the theme of the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Today, people... Don't follow but the Jesus, real Jesus. They want to follow. If you do that, you are not following Jesus. You're just following yourself. Jesus will not be your God. You will be your God. If you belong to the kingdom of this Christ, the King, you have to be like this King. You have to follow the examples of the King. You have to follow the commandments of this King. You have to walk with the King. That's an important condition. And there is no fast pass or easy pass to heaven. Do you follow this king? Amen.